You are listening to Social Europe Podcast. We discuss cutting-edge thinking on politics, economy and employment and labour with some of the most thought-provoking people around, including Nobel Prize winners and other internationally acclaimed experts. So welcome and enjoy the conversation. This episode of Social Europe Podcast is brought to you by the Zaid Business School, University of Oxford. Maximize your effectiveness in the changing global business environment with a postgraduate Oxford Diploma in Global Business. Taught in four short modules over a year, the program is designed to accelerate your career and increase your impact while minimizing the disruption to your work and family life. Learn alongside senior executives from around the world and develop a lifelong network. Visit the Oxford Diploma in Global Business website to find out more. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Social Europe Podcast. My name is Henning Meyer, Editor-in-Chief of Social Europe. Today, I'm in conversation with Gabriel Zuckman, who is an Associate Professor of Economics as well as Director of the Stone Center on Wealth and Income Inequality at the University of California at Berkeley. We're in conversation about Gabriel's most recent book, The Triumph of Injustice. As always, I hope you enjoy the conversation. Okay, Gabriel Zuckman, thank you very much indeed for taking the time to talk to me about uh, the topic of your most recent book. And uh, in order to get us going in the conversation, uh, what is your assessment? What would you say is the situation uh, currently in Western economies when it comes to the distribution of wealth and income? Uh, there's a discontent uh, in uh, many parts of the Western world with uh, the rise of inequality, which is a uh, uh, happening in uh, most uh, developed countries, although at different speed. But just to, to fix ideas, in 1980, the top 1% income share was 10% in the US and uh, in uh, Western Europe. Today, it's 20% in the US, 12% in Western Europe. So inequality has increased in both cases. It has increased uh, more in the US uh, uh, than in Europe, but everywhere. Uh, we see that more and more people have a feeling that uh, the modern economic system is properly for the working class and broad swath of the middle class. Okay, and uh, you know, beyond the questions that we're going to talk about uh, in a minute, what do you think uh, are the key drivers of this uh, drive towards higher inequality? Uh, there are the two, uh, two theses. There's one view which says oh, this is due to globalization and uh, uh, technological change, which has made uh, workers less productive. And there's another view uh, which says uh, that this is mostly due to uh, policies and changes in uh, public policies. And uh, I think that the fact that uh, inequality has uh, increased everywhere, but quite differently, especially has increased much more in the U.S., is more consistent with the view that uh, the main driver is uh, policy uh, changes. The, these changes have been particularly extreme in the U.S. Think about financial deregulation. Uh, think about the, the collapse in the minimum wage, uh, the decline in the power of unions, uh, the huge changes in taxation, in tax progressivity. The U.S. used to have the most progressive tax system in the world has changed uh, in, in the post-World War II decades, it has changed dramatically since the 1980s. Some of these changes have also happened uh, in Europe, but to a slightly less extreme uh, degree, uh, hence the difference in uh, the rise of inequality. So policies are the key driver. So, because if the first thesis was true, you would expect the application of technology is very similar across the board, but the, yeah. re the results are very different. Yeah, of course, yes. If technology and globalization in itself, you know, international trade was the key driver, we should see inequality increase pretty much everywhere at the same pace. Uh, you know, in Europe, people have computers as well, uh, and uh, just like in the US, and they trade a lot with uh, emerging economies, uh, with China, you know, even more actually than, uh, uh, than the US. Um, uh, but we don't see this uh, uh, inequality rising uh, exactly the same way everywhere. And uh, what, what kind of role do you think do the different political economies rather than the policies play? You know, the institutional setup, uh, how the economies are constituted? 
Um, uh, behind these big uh, changes in policies, there is, of course, a, a change in politics and in, in ideology and uh, the triumph, if you want, of uh, free market ideas and uh, small government ideas, you know, what people sometimes call neoliberalism or market fundamentalism, the idea that markets are, are always the best way to organize economic and uh, social activity. Uh, these ideas have been very powerful um, uh, for many years, for many decades. At the same time, we see today that uh, the, 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 the neoliberal model uh, has clear limits, you know, the right of inequality is one, uh, the uh, uh, you know, problem with global warming is the, is the other one, environmental degradation, and so there is a demand for uh, an alternative model. And uh, you know, as an economist, where would you basically draw the line personally? Where are markets the right mechanism to efficiently distribute scarce resources? And where do other factors, uh, like you know, providing public goods and you know, other other ideas play a significant role? I don't know. I think it's uh, it's not for economists uh, to say, you know, uh, uh, it's for the public to uh, to decide about what should be uh, uh, provided by uh, governments, by uh, uh, the community rather than by the market. Um, uh, I think there is a, a consensus in, in many countries and certainly in Europe that uh, healthcare, uh, education, uh, including early uh, childhood uh, education, child care, are better provided uh, by the community uh, than by the market, not only more efficiently, but also in a more inclusive manner because healthcare is very costly, child care is very costly, which means that if you only rely on private provision uh, with no public subsidies, then you exclude lots of, uh, of people from, uh, uh, from these essential uh, uh, services. But uh, fundamentally, I think it's for people to decide through democratic deliberation and the vote. It's not for economists to say this should be provided by the market, this should be provided by the government. Uh, this is a key political question, you know, what, 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 where the frontier should be put. And uh, uh, so, so nobody has the truth, uh, uh, the definitive answer to that question, which can only be obtained through the broadest uh, democratic uh, uh, discussion. So it's basically about the an estimation of the upsides and the downsides, you know, and then it's a political deliberation and the outcome of a political system dem with democratic legitimacy that basically needs to draw the line. Exactly. And the same thing for taxation. You know, uh, it's not for economists to say uh, the top tax rate for the, for the wealthiest individuals should be X or Y or the level of the tax to GDP ratio should be 30 percent or 50 percent or 70 percent. Not at all. Again, it's, uh, it has to be the outcome of a, a democratic uh, a debate and debates in, in parliament and the broadest public discussion and confrontation of ideas possible. But as you know, quite a few economists actually do that and say, for instance, you know, debt to GDP ratio of 90 percent, that's where the dynamics change and, and, and these sort of things. So you don't see any, any sort of iron laws that, you know, uh, where empiric evidence really points to different dynamics and that should be then taken into consideration, but it's purely political decision. I think, you know, no, no um, uh, 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 public policy question can be conclusively settled uh, by uh, economic research or research in the social sciences. You know, the, the, the facts that we establish, the theories that, that we uh, construct uh, are all provisory and imperfect and, uh, and, and there's never, you know, uh, the truth. Uh, nobody has the truth of these important questions. Uh, but we contribute collectively to a more informed debate or we can contribute. And so that's why it's perfectly legitimate for economists to, you know, intervene in the public debate, to talk about new ideas, sometimes to defend new ideas. Uh, but None of them can pretend to have a definitive answer, you know, because none of them has a definitive answer. Yeah, and often, you know, as you, as you mentioned, but quite a few economists rarely, re often do not, is there a lot of other contributing factors that, you know, are part of the political decision-making process that need to be taken into account that are not, that are not involved in any sort of academic research, whether it's in economics or in other so social sciences. 
yeah, no, economics in itself cannot cannot provide the answers. Yes, uh, but I think you know we economists can be can be useful in several ways. So, for instance, one is contributing to a more informed democratic debate by providing facts uh, uh, about, for instance, uh, how inequality has evolved, who pays what in taxes, how progressive the tax system really is. And when it comes to taxes, another way that we can be useful is by being a bit like plumbers. So, you know, Esther Duflo has this famous article, The Economist as a Plumber. Uh, and I think it's a metaphor that works really well for taxation. Uh, if there is a popular democratic demand for a more progressive tax system, we economists who work on, uh, on taxation, we can help design taxes that will work, that will address this demand for redistribution. Uh, uh, we can help explain how it's possible to tax better multinational companies, uh, to tax very wealthy individuals in a globalized world, how it's possible to reconcile globalization with progressive uh, taxation. So not to substitute, you know, ourselves to the public debate, but if there is this democratic will, we can, you know, help uh, uh, the world and the public policies work a bit better. Yeah, well, that's an interesting point. It's not basically deducting the policies from economic research, but actually putting economic research at the, you know, at the help as a helping tool for public policy decisions that are informed by a variety of influences. Absolutely. Okay, great. And you know, talking about the way how this could work, uh, let's get to the the the, the topic of, of of your most uh, recent book. Uh, I mean, how to how to tax the rich, or basically how the rich do avoid paying their fair share of taxes, and uh, you know, which is a prerequisite of the distribution of wealth and income that we already mentioned. So, what are the key points here? What what do you think are the, the biggest problems? Um, the key problem is that uh, there's been a triumph of what we call tax injustice. So what is tax injustice? It's a process through which the big winners from globalization, multinational companies and their shareholders uh, have seen their taxes fall, while at the same time, the economic actors who've not benefited a lot from globalization, like small businesses or retirees or low-wage workers, have seen their taxes increase. And uh, to put it differently, it's the, the combination of two uh, phenomena. One is the rise of inequality on one hand. The other is the decline of tax progressivity on the other hand. Uh, what's behind the decline in tax progressivity? Uh, w w some of this is due to ideological change, so to you know, the, 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 the triumph of the idea that by taxing the wealthy, uh, less, you would have you know, growth trickling down to the rest of the population. But that's not fundamental in my view. What's more fundamental is that policymakers from both left and right um, have become convinced, often sincerely, uh, that uh, in a globalized world, you can't tax you know, the more mobile uh, tax bases, like those, these big multinational firms or these very wealthy individuals. If you do so, they will move abroad, they will shift profits to tax havens, they will expatriate, they will hide uh, assets, they will conceal wealth, they will use this tax optimization industry that has developed. And uh, we wrote this book, The Triumph of Injustice, to explain why this view not only is dangerous, but also is wrong. You know, it's, it's dangerous because globalization is unlikely to be a sustainable process if it means ever lower taxes for its main winners and higher taxes for those who don't benefit a lot from it. It's not sustainable politically or economically. But more importantly, it's wrong because there are concrete ways to reconcile globalization and progressive taxation. And so in the book, we make concrete proposals for... Uh, collecting, for instance, what we call the tax deficit of multinational companies uh, for uh, taxing uh, 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 people with a lot of wealth who today have a low effective tax rate by reinventing uh, wealth taxation for the 21st century. So it's a message of hope. You know, We can, if we choose so, uh, to have progressive tax system, potentially high capital taxation, uh, even in the era of uh, globalization. And before we come to the actual policy uh, proposal, so the overall evidence then really seems to be that the, the tax quota has remained largely constant, but the tax burden has shifted from the winners who, who are basically claim we are mobile. If you tax us uh, as you used to, we'll just go away uh, to yeah, the I mean, immobile two, subjects. Two, two illustrations. One is uh, the US and the other is going to be more about Europe. 
If you look at the US, today when you take into account all taxes at all levels of government, uh, each group of the population, the working class, the middle class, the upper middle class, pays around 28% of its income in taxes, with one, ex- one and only one exception, which is billionaires, uh, who in 2018 have paid only 23% of uh, their income in taxes. So to put it differently, the US tax system is like a giant flat tax that becomes regressive at the very top end, with billionaires paying less uh, as a fraction of their income than, than their secretaries, basically. Um, in Europe, there is pretty much the same phenomenon. So for instance, in a country like France, it's also the case that the tax system becomes regressive at the top, that effective tax rates decline uh, below the average effective tax rate when you when you enter the top 0.1%. Um, uh, the only difference is just that the tax uh, take is, is higher. So you know, in the US, it's 28% uh, for most of the population, then falling to 23 in a country like France, it would be 20 points more, you know, 48% falling to 43%. Uh, but uh, the same process is true in France, and in many ways, uh, uh, the, the underlying forces that have led to this regressive tax system are even stronger in the European Union, uh, where you have uh, 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 tax competition that's very severe, uh, with a number of tax havens within the EU, offering very low tax rates, competing with other countries, uh, where you've seen a number of countries offering special tax regimes for uh, mobile tax bases, like, for instance, researchers or high wage earners in Denmark can get lower tax rates, or uh, the wealthy can get lower tax rates in Greece, or, you know, you know Italy and Portugal now have special tax regimes for, uh, to attract retirees. And so these forces of tax competition have been very, uh, very strong, the forces of tax evasion as well, with, for a very long time, um, massive concealment of wealth in tax havens like Switzerland, like uh, Luxembourg, and so on. Um, so that's uh, that's the driving uh, that's the driving force behind the decline in, in tax progressivity. And uh, one thing that always strikes me, I mean, of course, there is uh, there is a competition uh, in terms of the headline, uh, for instance, corporate tax rate. But barely any company pays the headline tax anyway. So <laughs> isn't it just uh, isn't that sometimes smoke and mirrors that, you know, you, you, you basically have a political haggle over the over the over the, the actual tax rate. But you, you should actually think about the, the rate that is actually being paid. Yeah, you're right that even in a, in, a, in a tax haven like Ireland that has a low statutory tax rate of 12.5%, the effective tax rate, uh, at least for foreign multinationals, is much lower than that, it's around 5%. Um, and there's a lot of opacity uh, about you know the tax rates that uh, these and that company uh, get with uh, 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 you know special tax deals that were uh, granted to specific firms that's being investigated by... Uh, uh, the European Union, uh, the EU Commission. Um, so, uh, 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 yes, there is this problem and there is a feeling of hopelessness in the EU because um, uh, for tax uh, matters, uh, the rule in the EU is the rule of unanimity. So there's no tax harmonization, no common tax policy that's possible unless the 27 member states uh, agree on, uh, on, on that common tax policy, which in practice... Uh, uh, you know, is equivalent to uh, uh, saying that uh, there will never be any tax policy because some countries benefit a lot from the status quo and from the current uh, race to the bottom. That's why one idea that we push in the book is the somewhat paradoxical idea that in practice the way to reach uh, an agreement, to reach uh, court, to, to reach an international uh, agreement or, or, or EU-wide coordination is by having countries at least initially taking unilateral action, uh, you know, saying, for instance, uh, uh, we are going to start uh, collecting the tax deficit of multinational firms. So Germany, let's say, could say, um, starting January 1st, 2021, for each firm, uh, we are going to compute their tax deficit, you know, meaning uh, the difference between what they pay in taxes today and what they would pay if they were taxed at a rate of 25% country by country, on a country by country basis. And then we, Germany, are going to collect part of that tax deficit uh, for a firm that you know, makes 20% of its global sales in Germany. Germany could say, we're going to collect 20% of the tax deficit. Uh, uh, and if 
a country like Germany or a small coalition of countries like Germany and France, I don't know, France and Belgium, start doing this and demonstrate that in practice it's possible to, to better tax, to tax more, the big multinational firms that don't pay a lot in taxes today, uh, then very quickly I think you will see other countries doing the same, you know, saying, look, there's money on the table, there is a tax deficit, there are some countries that choose not to collect taxes, but we can collect the taxes that they choose not to collect. We can act as tax collectors of last resort. And so you see how very quickly we can get a form of tax harmonization where all countries, in fact, collect the tax deficit. And in effect, the tax rate is uh, becomes 25% uh, pretty much everywhere because in a world where uh, uh, countries collect the tax, some countries uh, play the role of tax collector of last resort, there wouldn't be an incentive, any incentive anymore for firms to book earnings in tax havens because you know, low tax rates in Ireland would be offset by higher tax rates in Germany or in France, uh, higher tax payments in those countries. And so there wouldn't be any incentive anymore for tax havens to offer low tax rates in the first place. And so you would see Ireland, Bermuda, increase their tax rate. And so we would move from the current race to the bottom to a race to the top. And it can happen relatively quickly, I think, once at least one or two countries, you know, show the way and uh, take the actual action and pave the way for this kind of shift uh, in uh, uh, global uh, behavior. I mean, some of the uh, some of this effective minimum taxation is being trialed or being pushed in the OECD uh, framework. And I think the US has something similar to it, like an effective minimum tax. Uh, I mean, I know the reservations, for instance, in, in, in Germany, often in policy circles, is that if you have a trade surplus, <laughs> you and, and the others adopt it, you 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 think you might lose more than you actually win by 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 doing that. So that's why the the, the German policy discussion is around creating an, uh, creating something like this, uh, especially in the in the OECD framework. And if not in the OECD framework, at least within the European Union, as such. So, but where, how do you evaluate these recent attempts to establish something like this? Um, I think that the recent attempt, you know, the, the current discussion at the OECD about minimum taxation uh, is clearly going in the right direction. For a long time, the OECD was only talking about the definition of the tax base. But look, you know, if you have a perfectly defined tax base and then you apply a rate of uh, 5%, 2%, and 0% eventually, it's a big waste of time. So it's good to finally talk about minimum taxation. Of course, the question is about what's going to be the minimum tax rate. You know, if it's just to pick the lowest tax rate among G20 countries, you know, you've not really made any progress. If the minimum tax rate becomes something like 20, 25%, then you really change things. So, so a lot will depend on what's the tax rate that's, uh, that's agreed upon. Um, and I want to stress that the system that we describe in the book, you know, collecting the tax deficit of multinational companies, by construction, you know, if Germany did it, it would, it would gain tax revenue. So the idea is to let countries do what they do today, change nothing, you know, let them have their corporate tax rate and, uh, uh, you know, the current system. And simply speaking, if some companies uh, have a tax deficit that is, at least in some countries, they pay less than 25% uh, effective tax rate, there must be at least one country that steps in and says, we're going to collect part of that tax deficit. So by construction, any country that does that is going to only increase its tax collection. You know, for, the, for, the, for the companies that are already uh, paying 25% or more country by country, they have no tax deficit. For them, nothing changes. It's only for the, country, for the, for the corporations that have a less than 25% country by country tax rate that, that their taxes will increase. Um, uh, uh, and so it can be, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it is just, uh, uh, it, it would increase, you know, uh, tax collection uh, in, in, in any country. And, and one of the problems that, you know, I, I hear in these discussions is that this would reverse or, sw or s flip the, uh, you know, the, the system because it's no longer uh, ta you tax at the place of production, but effectively tax at the, at the place of sale. Um, so is, is that, is that uh, one of the difficulties of implementing this? No, I think, again, you know, it's um, um, uh, the idea is just to say any country should do whatever, you know, as it does today or whatever it wants to do. And for some countries, it makes sense to, you know, uh, uh, have taxes based on uh, the location of production and uh, let them do whatever they want. But in the current system, uh, there's no... Uh, 
uh, guardrail, which means that if a company uh, uh, has been able to shift profits to tax havens uh, and to book uh, billions uh, in zero tax places, like Google, for instance, in 2018 has made $20 billion in revenue in Bermuda. So uh, uh, there is a tax deficit. There's no guardrail today, which means that no country taxes these, these profits in Bermuda. And the only idea that, that we're putting forward you know, in the book, it's a new idea, but it's a simple idea. It's just to say some countries have to step in and to say, look, it's the right of Bermuda to choose a 0% tax rate. Uh, it's the right of Ireland to choose 12.5% or in practice 5%. But we, Germany or France or Belgium, we consider that the normal rate is 25%. And if you want to have access to our market, uh, and you have a tax deficit relative to this norm of 25%, you will have to pay an extra tax in Germany, in France, or in Belgium. And uh, you, you mentioned that this is a, a nice way to avoid the collective action problem that is usually be, you know, a problem in, in, in these sort of issues. But at the same time, obviously, the more countries would adopt such a policy at the same time, uh, yeah. the more effective it would be. So do you see any, any chance, say, that some of, at least some of the leading European countries could I'm, come together? I'm very optimistic because uh, once one country does that and demonstrates that it's been able to increase its tax collection, by taxing, by collecting part of the tax deficit of Google or Apple or, you know, uh, uh, big French multinationals or whatever, then other countries will say, oh, that's incredible. You know, the, the, we, there's money on the table here to grab. And France is grabbing part of it, but why don't we do it as well? And you'll see a process starting like that, where, you know, all countries start collecting part of the tax deficit. Until there's no tax deficit anymore and all corporations pay at least 25% country by country. And there you go, you harmonized corporate tax rate. And uh, what would you do in terms of the, the, this is basically how you could tax uh, corporations, but what about the wealthy individuals? Uh, ah, yeah, the wealthy individuals is, uh, uh, you know, is a problem that also has a solution. So uh, in the debate about wealth taxation uh, in, in Europe, one recurring idea is the idea that Oh, it's impossible to tax the super rich because uh, if we do it on our on our own, you know, uh, then they will expatriate, they will move to Switzerland or you know to to low tax places that don't have, don't have a wealth tax. And the answer is pretty simple. The answer is to say uh, countries should tax expatriates for at least a few years. So the idea is, let's say you know you, you uh, you've made a huge fortune in Germany, you've become a billionaire. You know, it's good for you, it's great, but you become a billionaire in part thanks to German infrastructure and German workers who've been trained by German teachers. And all German taxpayers have helped pay for these things for their taxes. And so there's no natural right to expatriate, to move to a tax haven once you've become a billionaire and immediately stop paying anything to Germany. It doesn't make sense. Uh, uh, the U.S. is the polar case. You know, in the U.S., if you're a U.S. national, U.S. citizen, you have to pay taxes no matter where you live. So taxes follow you for the rest of your life. Maybe it's too extreme, but the, the, the polar opposite, which is what European countries are doing today, which is as soon as you move you know, on January 1st of the next year, you don't have to pay anything anymore to your home country, is too extreme as well. And so the, the solution that I defend is to, to reach a kind of middle ground that says, if you've been a tax resident, let's say, in Germany for 20 years or 30 years, and you move abroad, you, you still have to pay taxes in Germany for maybe 5, 10 years, depending on the number of years that you've been a tax resident in Germany, maybe. And so like that, you can reduce dramatically the problem of uh, tax competition between countries and the risk of expatriation. And uh, how would you deal with the sort of the f potential double taxation? Say, if you then move to Switzerland and they, tra they tax you, you well. credits, it's a good question. So you, what Germany would say is, is you still have to pay taxes in, the, in, in Germany with credits given for foreign taxes. So if you move to a country that also has a wealth tax, which is the same as the German wealth tax, you wouldn't, you, you wouldn't have anything to pay in Germany. It's just like in, it works in the U.S. right now. If you are a U.S. citizen... You move to France, you have to pay taxes in France. There's basically no expense in the US. But if you move to the Cayman Islands, uh, uh, there's no tax in the Cayman Islands, then you have to pay extra taxes uh, in the US. So basically linking uh, taxation to citizenship uh, to a large extent as well. 
uh, not necessarily citizenship, but linking taxation to where you've built your wealth, you know, for the purpose of the wealth tax. If you become a billionaire by being a tax president in Germany for 30 years, you owe something to the German community, okay? And so it's legitimate for Germany to say, you're going to have to pay, you know, taxes for a few extra years in Germany. So to residency, effectively. So Yeah, to, re to residency, to where exactly, to where you meet your wealth. Yeah. Okay. Great. I mean, um, and if we come now to the political solutions uh, part of it, the policy uh, part of it, I mean, uh, you, you, you know, in, in Europe and in the US, there are uh, political upheavals uh, uh, that are partially a reaction to some of these economic injustices, partially a reaction to some other factors. So if you were a policymaker, where would you start? What, what would be your top three policy recommendations, maybe for a nation state as well as for the European Union? I mean, we are reasonably at the beginning um, of a new European Commission, right? So this is still, uh, it is still setting its priorities for, uh, for the years to come. So what, what would your top three priorities be if you were a, a policymaker and how would you go about them? Look, I would do what I described, you know, ta taxing multinationals, collecting the tax deficit of multinationals is one. So to demonstrate very clearly that it's possible to reconcile globalization and capital taxation and to, to make the big winners from globalization contribute more, which I think would, would, would um, uh, help reconcile the working class, the middle class with globalization and with European integration, showing, look, you know, we can tax these big winners, which means that we can also cut taxes for, uh, you know, the working class, the middle class, because in the European Union, in many countries, the tax to GDP ratio is already pretty high, so the point is not to increase, you know, necessarily tax collection. In the US is different, but in many European countries, you know, you can imagine just to, to collect more taxes on some actors, to cut taxes on the rest of the population. Um, the wealth tax is the same logic, so reintroduce a modern wealth tax that draws the lessons from uh, the long European experience with wealth taxation that dates back to the 19th century, uh, and that had limitations, you know, there was no serious attempt at taxing expatriates, there was a lot of tax evasion, uh, the wealth taxes were archaic with no pre-populated wealth tax returns, so people just had to self-declare their wealth. Uh, uh, with lots of lobbying to introduce exemptions and deductions over time. So I would recreate a wealth tax that, that, that draws the lessons from all of this, which means maybe starting a bit higher in the wealth distribution. Uh, the European wealth taxes started around $1 million. Today, what's proposed in the US by Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders uh, is a wealth tax that's, that start at around 30 million euros in uh, net wealth. Um, Uh, but in exchange for that, you know, to have really broad taxes on all, all assets, about 30 million, no deduction, no uh, exemption, uh, would be taxed. Um, uh, and um, uh, and the third thing, you know, is, is of course, uh, environmental taxes, you know, uh, carbon taxes, and maybe potentially progressive carbon taxes, you know, if we found good ways to measure emissions at the individual level, that's something that's totally doable. So... Uh, to me, these are, you know, important reforms to illustrate the idea that, uh, look, we, we can combine market, a thriving market economy, globalization, European integration with safeguard, safeguarding the, the, the climate, the planet on one hand, and uh, 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 making sure that the gains from globalization are spread out or equally distributed by concentrated in just a few hands. Okay, great. Gabriel Zuckman, I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. Thank you very much again for taking the time uh, to talk to me today. And I'm sure this topic is not going to go away anytime soon. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for listening. We hope you enjoyed it. Make sure you don't miss future episodes by subscribing to Social Europe Podcast. You can also read our articles on www.socialeurope.eu and follow us on Facebook and on Twitter at Social Europe. Until next time.